What will happen if all the nuclear power plants in the world explode? You are accustomed to drinking your tasty aromatic coffee in the morning, being wrapped in your favorite fluffy bathrobe in the evenings, having dinner in the bosom of your family. Do you think that it will always be so? What if one day upon opening the window, instead of birds chirping, you hear one giant hell of a boom, and the blissfully blue sky is dotted with huge flaming mushroom clouds? Turning on the TV, you find that a disaster has occurred all over the world. Our nuclear power stations have exploded, all of them, every single one. With horror, you begin to contemplate what will happen next. This situation is based in reality. There are about 430 stationary nuclear power plants and 200 floating reactors operating on our planet right now. The waterborne reactors are located on submarines, icebreakers, and floating power plants. By the middle of the 21st century, the total number of reactors will double, reaching about 898. At the moment, these formidable installations are all quite warm and fuzzy. They are working quietly, providing energy for power stations. But if all of them simultaneously exploded, there would be hell to pay. What would happen after the explosion? How would the progress of mankind change? And how realistic are these suppositions? But before I begin to answer these questions, I would first like to recommend something to you. Alliance is the new mobile RPG I got stuck in the last few weeks. There are over 400 unique characters, which can be combined into more than 10,000 different combinations. Amazing game regimes. My favorite one is the deadly battle with giant bosses, and PvP, with which I sometimes play with friends, as well as really large-scale battles between guilds. I could talk about this game for hours, but it's better to go and check it out yourself. Download Alliance right after seeing this video and get a huge bonus of 50,000 gold and 50 precious stones immediately. Nuclear power plants could explode for several reasons. For example, if a couple of international superpowers, who today get along like cats and dogs, exchange greetings in the form of nuclear bombs. Or perhaps explosions could be arranged by terrorists or members of bizarre sects who advocate hate towards almost every living thing. Alternatively, Mother Nature could rebel, inasmuch as we've been exploiting her so badly for such a long time. She could arrange for a global 20 points on the Richter scale earthquake, and the surface of the Earth would burst like a nutshell. It's obvious that no nuclear power plant could withstand such a powerful kick from nature. After this, our planet would turn into a real hell. No living creature will survive. At least, that's what the hero of the popular American TV series The 100 claims. In that series, humanity has to travel to other planets in order to survive after the disaster. But not for long. According to the interplanetary settlers' prognostications, after six years, the atmosphere of our home planet should clear up. After that, the escapees have intentions to return. Of course, this is just sci-fi fantasy, but remember how many times science fiction writers have predicted the future. Arthur C. Clarke, for example, wrote about the emergence of artificial Earth satellites long before they existed, and H.G. Wells imagined atomic weapons 30 years before their first use. Nevertheless, we believe scientists more. What do they think about a possible apocalypse? And can we survive one under conditions where migration to other planets is not yet available? Using information collected after the Chernobyl and Fukushima nuclear disasters, Japanese scientists have modeled just such a situation as we have been discussing. The simultaneous explosion of all nuclear reactors on Earth will exceed 500 times the power and intensity of the Chernobyl accident. This would render the Earth unsuitable for human life, not for six years, but for a much longer 156 years. After the explosions, the cities of our dear planet will begin to burn like torches. The height of the firestorms would reach up to 5 kilometers high. Their flames will turn almost any material into ash. The firestorms will suck in everything whatsoever that gets in their way, and will not end until they burn the entire planet to the ground. As a result, an incredibly large amount of soot, smoke, and dust will rise into the air, blocking off the light of the sun. 
a nuclear winter will come to the Earth. An incredible cold would envelop the planet. In the winter months, the temperature would reach 50 degrees below zero. And in the summer, the frost would carry on even in tropical regions. For several years, the entire globe would freeze to a depth of several meters. The rains would end and never seen before storms would commence. But almost no one would be there to see it. Most of the Earth's living creatures, including humans, would die right after the explosions. The surfaces of any unfrozen rivers, seas, and lakes, and sometime later, these slowly cooling oceans, would be covered with rotting dead fish and other putrefying marine species. All of the various food chains would rupture. Perhaps on the planet there would remain some low-level life forms, for example, mosses and lichens. But the higher life forms, including, incidentally, the despised rats and cockroaches, would perish. But this fact would be little solace to the smattering of people who, perhaps, might somehow survive after the apocalypse. But they wouldn't have time to think about the hated rodents and insects. The survivors would slowly die off from radiation poisoning and lack of food and potable water. But what if this all weren't so? There is an opposing theory. It says that even in case of an explosion of all the nuclear power plants on the Earth at the same time, there would be no nuclear winter. The author of this research is a famed Russian scientist in the field of fires and fire safety, one Yosef Abduragimov. His main postulate is that hundreds of nuclear tests have already been carried out on the planet and that they did not create fire tornadoes and didn't throw thousands of tons of dust and soot into the atmosphere. Moreover, the eruptive force of the largest volcanoes on the planet exceed by many times the capacity of nuclear devices created by us lowly humans. And though the volcano's emissions have been monstrous, they did not eclipse the sun. The Earth's atmosphere is so immense and remarkable that even a nuclear war cannot completely clog it up. By the way, science fails to provide a singular answer to the question of what would bring more harm, the explosion of an atomic bomb or a nuclear power plant. Everyone agrees that the main difference involves time parameters. The bomb is an instantaneous device. The energy it releases is a thousand times faster in comparison with an atomic reactor meltdown. This leads some researchers to believe that multiple nuclear bomb strikes would lead to catastrophe on a monstrous scale, whereas a series of accidents at nuclear power plants wouldn't threaten globe-spanning cataclysms. Others, conversely, argue that the destruction of nuclear nuclear power plants would give a slow but much longer spread of radiation. At the same time, radiation would cover immeasurably large areas, as compared to the explosion of an atomic bomb. Who is right? God knows. But I think, as folk wisdom states, between two evils tis not worth choosing. Let's return all the same to the firestorm. In fact, large-scale forest fires are not uncommon on our lovely Earth and they are certainly not smaller than tornadoes and explosions at nuclear power plants. But why aren't tornadoes observed during these fires? And indeed, the soot remaining after a forest fire is dozens of times less than what we would expect after a nuclear catastrophe. The fact is that the burning of forests are generally located over large areas and not concentrated in one place, as would be the case with exploding nuclear power plants. In approximately the same way, in cities, combustible substances that burn are spread out and deposited in various places around the buildings and other structures. In such a case, only up to about 20% of all the materials burn. There isn't enough energy for more widespread damage, even in the case of the largest fires. But even if a firestorm nevertheless is formed, a powerful airflow arises in the turbulent zone, thus increasing combustion efficiency. And even in such a scenario, the quantity of soot and other harmful particles and effects would still be much less than that occurring after an explosion at a nuclear power station. Another ace in the hole of the nuclear power plant is radiation. Of course, radioactive contamination is extremely dangerous for humans and all living things. But even today, people manage to survive in conditions of increased background radiation. For example, in areas after the testing of nuclear bombs, 
or near the two nuclear disasters that have already occurred, Chernobyl and Fukushima. Furthermore, underground shelters that exist in many cities would help the inhabitants of the planet to wait out the catastrophe. In the opinion of some experts, not only special bunkers, but also metros, catacombs and caves, and other similar underground structures would serve the purpose quite well. Only underground shelters which were located less than 100 meters from the epicenters would be destroyed immediately. Suppose people survive. What has the morrow in store for us? Many researchers believe under such conditions of large amounts of radiation that DNA would be damaged and there would be mutations. Occurrences of cancer would increase exponentially. This would not be the most flattering way to affect a person's appearance. Ugly symptoms such as teary eyes and inflamed skin would debase yesterday's heretofore omnipotent Homo sapiens as they wander through the vast deserts which the stricken planet has been transformed into. They would gaze desperately at the ruined cities and lament the crops and plants that have disappeared from the face of the earth. The earth will not prepare food for them and the grass spreading up through the soil dirty with the wreckage of civilization will barely be able to dull the gnawing pangs of hunger. It might even be that people under such conditions, driven by despair, would revert to cannibalism, eating from among their own species. But what if? What if this worldwide nuclear catastrophe would, for the planet, lead not to tragedy, but through a peculiar sort of purgatory that would then guide us to the flourishing of a new civilization? Ronald Chesser, a biologist and scientist from the University of Texas, believes precisely in such a future development. First, according to his theory, soon after the explosions, the planet would become clean and clear, like a teardrop. For several years, the various bodies of water that cover the Earth, which people have turned into a poisonous bullion today, would be cleared of nitrates and phosphates. True, in groundwaters, many harmful substances would remain for much longer, but over the next 100 to 200 years, bacteria would neutralize them. Automobile exhaust and the output of industrial gases would dissipate more quickly. In two or three weeks, it would become much easier to breathe. And during this period, rainfall would wash away all the nitrogen oxides and sulfur from the atmosphere. Other ecosystems would also begin to revive and thrive at approximately the same pace. In warm and humid regions, faster. In cold regions, a little longer. The truth is that radionuclides, which would endure in this paradise, would affect the mutational process over the centuries, especially near the epicenters of the catastrophe. They will make their own corrections to the planet's surface and ecosystems. But the changes wouldn't be negative. The whole world will be covered with heavy growth, trees, shrubs, and herbaceous plants would begin to produce bumper harvests. Chickens under the influence of radiation could grow as big as sheep, and the sheep as big as cows, and the cows might even become difficult to distinguish from dinosaurs. What would happen to Homo sapiens? It's difficult to say exactly because many scientists are considering only the variety of mutations under conditions of high radiation. Proceeding from this, any possibility could very likely be an incredible one. On the street, for example, a rose, a man, and a skunk may all cross paths, and each would think about how the other smells so terribly bad, as stink and fragrance are relative definitions. And if that didn't happen, what if the stories we've heard about all the different mutants, both beautiful and ugly, are just more Hollywood fantasies and horror stories, which the media simply regurgitate on demand in the pursuit of ratings and riches? Doctor of Physical and Mathematical Sciences Rafael Arutunian is sure that a nuclear catastrophe would not destroy the human genome. The entire global scientific community in over 60 years of detailed scientific research has never found any genetic consequences from radiation exposure. Moreover, the International Commission for Radiological Protection, 20 years after the Chernobyl accident, recognized that there is no reason to even talk about genetic risks, and reduced them by almost 90%. And maybe everything that we're talking about previously is just a game of imagination. Maybe it's not even worth it to worry about accidents like the one at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Besides, hundreds of experts from different countries around the world now assure us that such a catastrophe could not happen again on the Earth under any circumstances. 
Recently, the scientific community engaged seriously in the study of severe accidents, including those at nuclear power plants. It's become a priority to ensure the safe operation of nuclear power plants so that all nuclear reactors are now equipped with multiple protection systems. For example, hundreds of security parameters are continuously transferred to crisis centers from every block from all nuclear power plants. This, according to experts, guarantees absolute control over the situation. Reactors are also being securely protected and hardened from terrorist attacks not only from the ground, but also from the air. And this is provided by specially trained professionals, not by green newcomers. At their disposal are the most modern missile anti-aircraft installations, weapons, and the latest electronics. So nothing gets by these guys, right? But what if something did get past? If the role of the terrorist again comes from nature, let's not forget that the accident at the Fukushima 1 reactor occurred as a result of an earthquake and tsunami. At any moment, such a situation could arise again as, unfortunately, we cannot control the Earth's natural processes. If we miss the moment, the losses could be very high. According to some reports, there were roughly 2,000 victims of the disaster in Japan, and 4 million people were affected by the explosions from the Chernobyl reactor. Should we wait until they turn into Universal Alarm?